I am David Catling. Oh, and where are you from? I am a professor in Earth and Space Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. Oh, and are we alone? Uh, we're not alone, possibly. Um, from an observational point of view, we know of no others, so we are alone at this point in the 21st century. Oh, and uh, so you don't expect to find uh, alien spaceships visiting Earth anytime soon? Um, probably not, because there's no evidence that they have done recently or in the past. Hmm. All right, and uh, now you're an expert in uh, atmospheres, in the early atmosphere in particular. So what was the Earth's atmosphere like uh, a billion years ago, two billion years ago, three billion years ago, four billion years ago? Well, if we go back two and a half billion years, and before that, then there was negligible levels of oxygen, less than a part per million. And so that had consequences for life. So life like us, animal-like life that breathes oxygen, was basically impossible. So the atmosphere has been critical for the evolution of life, and the evolution of life has in turn affected the atmosphere. So that makes it an interesting thing to study for astrobiology. Oh, but how about uh, before that, when life got started, I guess, about four billion years ago, what do you think the atmosphere was like then? Uh, certainly free of oxygen, because if there had been a lot of oxygen around, it would have oxidized the organic molecules and they would have turned to carbon dioxide, which is not useful. So, so what does that mean that life, if it gets started, has to be in a reducing atmosphere? Um, a reducing atmosphere is a normal place for a planet to start with. You know, that's what its atmosphere is like. And so... Yes, um, but you, life doesn't have to start on the surface of a planet. There are locally reducing environments such as hydrothermal vents where hot water fluxes through the seafloor and comes out in hot springs on the seafloor that life could have started there. I mean, so um, we still don't know where life originated exactly. But can you make any guess as to whether life is a cosmic imperative that should start on anywhere, like an Earth-like planet with water on it, or is it somehow unique, or can you say anything about that? Um, simple answer is we don't know, and that's why it's worth looking for. But what do we know? We know that all life on Earth uses liquid water. We know that all life on Earth uses redox chemistry, and therefore if we want to look for properties of life as we know it, then we should look for a planet that has liquid water on its surface when we look at for exoplanets. And perhaps as some sign of redox disturbances going on reflected in its atmosphere or what we can detect remotely. And now you've written recently a paper about this chemical disequilibrium in the atmospheres of planets in our solar system. And do you think, based on that type of test, we'll be able to distinguish life-bearing planets from non-life-bearing planets? We could do, if we um, are lucky enough to find atmospheres that perhaps are a bit like our own, so we know what's going on and can understand them. So in our own atmosphere, we have a lot of oxygen, uh, which is hard to do in the absence of life. We have molecules like methane, which should be destroyed by the oxygen, and so that means there's a big flux, um, which could be from volcanoes, but it's so big that, that most of it is, is biological. We also have a lot of nitrogen, which should react with the oxygen, but that's also maintained by biology. So we have a strange mix of gases, and I think if we find a strange mix of gases that seems to be out of chemical equilibrium, that could mean that those gases are biogenic, and it could mean that life is on the planet. And we had a little bit of a debate, you and I, between whether this, these waste gases or this chemical disequilibrium is due to a, a poo, a waste product, or is it the pantry? Is it somehow an adaptive feature that life uses to maintain itself and keep the redox going? And uh, you think, keep on suggesting that it's a waste product, a waste product, a byproduct. And I just thought it would be a, an adaptive feature like oxygen here that allows, allows us to walk around and breathe. And that seems like such a, a nice thing that I would call it adaptive. Response. Um, well, I think animals and other creatures that use oxygen have adapted to the environment. So it's adaptive in that sense. But oxygen is, at the end of the day, a waste product of photosynthesis. The photosynthesis release it precisely because they want to get rid of it. Um, so, this But all heterotrophs depend on what you might call waste products, whether it be the original heterotrophs with, which chomped on the, uh, I guess, the 
car not carbohydrates, but hydrocarbons or amino acids, whatever it was that fell from mm -hmm. the sky, they could be used to drive life. And then as soon as there's life and then it died, then you could eat up those things. And isn't that how heterotrophic life first started? And so why I don't understand the use of waste product here. What is not a waste product? What is not a waste product? Yeah. Well, somebody's waste product can be somebody's food for sure. I don't disagree with that. But if you were to maintain that um, the disequilibrium in the Earth's atmosphere was somehow regulated in a way by the biosphere for the benefit of the biosphere, I think that's a different argument. And at the moment, it's not clear how that works mechanistically. So if you could provide a mechanistic process that such a system would evolve and show that, then you should write a paper about it and leave the scientific community to decide whether that makes sense or not. But at the moment, it's just an idea, a concept, which doesn't quite have legs, and so, so I'm not so, willing to accept it. So you think life, like your body, can control its temperature, and obviously where we are here is uh, controlled somewhat by life, and, uh, but you're not willing to uh, say that anything bigger than that can be controlled by the life forms. I think Like that, a dam for a beaver, for example. The beaver think, controls the water level. I think the regulation of um, the atmospheric composition is a mix of biological regulation and abiological regulation. So for example, in the textbooks, uh, since the 1980s when it was first figured out, we realized that you know, the, the, the amount of carbon dioxide on long time scales of half a million years or more is controlled by, in part, an abiological process, which is that if you raise the amount of carbon dioxide, you warm the planet through the greenhouse effect, but then you increase the rate at which uh, the carbon dioxide is drawn down through weathering and burial. Well, how about the time when there was not, weathering was incapable, well, there weren't continental crusts, and therefore the, this weathering didn't come into exist, didn't play much of a role, and you had methane, for example. The, the, the amount of methane in the atmosphere, that probably was, was that a waste gas from biology? Yeah, so <laughs> there are methanogens, they make methane as part of their um, and methanotrophs were eating it? And methanotrophs would eat some of it, but um, they can only eat it if there are oxidants available. And so before the rise of oxygen, which was 2.4 billion years ago, which flooded in the atmosphere and changed that uh, composition, um, they couldn't be very efficient at that. So a lot of methane accumulated in the atmosphere. Now, then there would have been some different regulation for sure. It wasn't the simple carbonate silicate cycle. So met methanotrophs would be breathing in methane and then using H2S as an electron acceptor, or what were they no, using they for oxygen? They could be using sulfate if there's sulfate. any. Uh, there is a bit of that produced in the atmosphere, even in the absence of um, oxygen, but not very much. So um, they would be rather limited. So they would be sulfate limited? So A little bit. Methanogens produce lots of methane. It builds up in the atmosphere until it gets to a certain level. Then the methanotroph says, hmm, all this food around here, all I need is an electron acceptor. Hey, there's some sulfate here. Let's use that. It's sulfate in the ocean, and they can sit with a sediment water interface and use the sulfate, react it with the methane, and make a living. But they can only make a poor living because there's not much sulfate around. So you think they were sulfate limited the way that some yes. places are phosphate or, or yes, iron limited? very much so. And so the methane would accumulate, but you know, there are physical things that are happening too. If you have too much methane, then it will fertilize and it will also warm the earth perhaps too much. And so one, or, or actually one, one possible feedback is you form an organic haze like that, which we find on, on Titan, um, would be somewhat different for the early earth, but that could uh, reflect sunlight away and cool the planet. So that would also, and then maybe s diminish the biosphere. And so there might be some, there could be a biogenic regulation um, in that particular case. But to be honest, we don't really know what was, what was regulating the climate of the, of the early earth. These are just ideas. So based on all the ideas you have about the origin of life on earth, or do you think we're alone in the universe? Um, as I said before, currently we don't know of any life anywhere else. So from an observational point of view, we're alone. However, uh, when we look at the Earth, we see that um, life did arise and the principles on which life operates, the requirements of liquid water and the requirements of redox chemistry, 
uh, could, could s these things could exist on other planets, and therefore I think it's worth looking. And I suppose I'm just optimistic from a philosophical point of view, uh, and partly that's because a number of years ago we didn't know whether any exoplanets existed at all. Well, now we know that they're abundant in the galaxy, and it's possible one, one uh, outcome could be that, that life is abundant throughout the galaxy if we could just see it in the same way that exoplanets were abundant, but we couldn't see them. But once we got eyes um, through our various telescopes and techniques, we could see them. It may be that there are many of these planets out there in the habitable zones where they have liquid water on the surface. And if we just had the right telescopes and the right instruments, we would be totally surprised that life is abundant throughout the galaxy. That's a possibility. I don't know that. It's just, I think we should be open to that idea. Well, about, and therefore, we should look. How about nano-aliens? Do you know any microscopists who have looked for nano-aliens in their very high magnification images? I'm not sure what you mean by a nano-alien. That's a nano, an alien made out of a thousand atoms or something, or 10,000 atoms, and they zoom around and they are everywhere, but we just haven't recognized them yet. Um, I think that's highly improbable, because uh, if you have so few atoms, you can't have a genome, you can't encode much information. These things uh, basically wouldn't be able to function as a life form. How about viruses? Um, are viruses life forms? Uh, well, there's a debate, debate about that. So some biologists I've met say that viruses are alive, and, and I think the majority say they're not. And the reason they say they're not is because they are basically parasitic, so they have to hijack another organism to reproduce. Isn't that what cannot... you're doing right now, hijacking the oxygen of plants well, I'm to not, reproduce? I'm not exactly reproducing. That means having babies. Yeah. Well, if I took you and a female... <laughs> and I'm not, right, I'm not doing that right now. I hope you'll appreciate it. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. about... I wouldn't do it in front of a camera oh, anyway. Or do, you think we're, do you think this is all a simulation from an advanced civilization? No, I don't. Why not? Um, I think we can apply Occam's razor, which is what we, we take the simplest... Uh, solution and to say it's just we're, we're living in a simulation I think is a very la an elaborate theory and so um, in general elaborate theories are usually nonsense. Well in physics but how about in biology elaborate is what is that if there's anything about life it's elaborate. Uh, I think you're mistaking the complexity of biology with um, what you need to explain it. I mean at the end of the day biology must all be explained by chemistry and physics. There's no magic going on. I thought and there was magic when you produce life form, like my laptop is starting to get smarter and smarter, and my smartphone is starting to come alive. Um, you don't consider those to be life forms or proto-life forms? Um, you know, I don't think they're quite life forms yet because they're not independent entities. You consider yourself in, an independent entity? Well, they're not in the sense, I'm not saying, what I mean by independent is within a particular environment. They're not um, reproducing and metabolizing. They're not reproducing, they get reproduced all the time. Well, they're not doing that. They're, there's people in China who are putting little components in, right. uh, in the factories. Right. So they're not reproducing um, the, themselves. If Once they start reproducing themselves, so an what, iPhone gives birth to mean? another iPhone. What does that mean, then, reproducing then, yourself? I can't imagine two people hermetically sealed in an iron capsule in outer space trying to reproduce themselves. It wouldn't work at all because they don't have all the other life forms that they are obligatorily well, no, embedded you're in, in. You're embedded in an environment, but... Just like an iPhone is embedded in a factory, you're embedded with people doing this to it, and it's, it's parasitic on the things that are creating it. Uh, no, because it doesn't have a genome which is directing the a blueprint. reproduction. So the of, blueprint gets reproduced to factory to factory, and then it's it gets, not their own. It's done by humans. It's, not their, it's done by humans. Right. You think humans are doing that? Yes. <laughs> okay. I think I think the managers at Apple could control what the next iPhone is going to look like. You do. It's not could. They do. I thought that was controlled by the the ideas that are marketed that fit into people's heads that makes them want to buy some things rather than others. Well, to be living, it would be the iPhone itself, which decides that what the iPhone decides. So decides I, what the so iPhone or, doesn't or have determines, free will, therefore it, it, it doesn't have it life. It determines, rather, I should have said. Um, so it's the iPhone itself, which is determining the next iPhone. 
So if you're going from iPhone 98 and to iPhone 99, so and, and that's... people determine themselves um, what's going to be their child? Their DNA, which the is DNA. part of them, which defines them. So the DNA determines that? Yes, it does. So the DNA is alive then? The DNA is an essential part of an organism. It's, it's like a factory. Is it an essential part of a, an iPhone or something? No. Or the, it's maybe like, the blueprints of it's it's like the blueprint part of it. is an essential um, part of the iPhone. But, but what life has is a blueprint that within an environment allows the life to reproduce, metabolize, and evolve. Well, I'm, I'm about a little while ago, a very rich uh, Russian gave $100 million to search for aliens. Uh, mm -hmm. If I gave you $100 million or more, well, how would you use it if, if, if I specified that you had to use it to try to answer the question, are we alone? What would you do? Okay, well, I need a bit more than $100 million. How much do you need? A billion dollars. Give uh, you as much as you need. Okay. How much I you need, need? I need as much to build probably, um, if you want to look for life on exoplanets, then uh, rather than the solar system. One could think of looking for life in the solar system, such as in Europa's ocean or something like that. But let's consider just the exoplanet question. Okay. What we need is something like a 10 meter diameter uh, telescope in space, which therefore has the right resolution to be able to see Earth-sized planets. So it's also equipped with the, uh, there's different ways of doing it, but a way to block out the starlight and we can also equip it with a spectrograph so it can look at the spectra coming from the reflected light of a Earth-like planet. And we can therefore look to see whether there are potentially a mix of biogenic gases on I'm, other planets. I'm giving you as much money as you want and you only want to build a 10 meter telescope? Well, okay, I'm just being reasonable. I <laughs> could, uh, you can build it as big as possible, but no uh, ten, ten, 10 meters, could, we could do interferometry too, um, but that gets more expensive. I'm I, just, I told you, I'll give you as much money as you want. I'll give you $100 trillion. What are you going to do with it? $100 trillion, that's yeah. an awful lot of money. It is. What are you going to do with it? Well, okay, in that case, you'll do all sorts of things. Like you'll what? you'll, you'll uh, put money into SETI, into looking, searching for extraterrestrials and expand the number of channels and do that constantly instead of sporadically as it's been done. Um, you'll uh, have enormous telescopes in space, maybe as big as you can, uh, as current technology allows. Maybe that's something like tens of meters. Um, you could uh, also, if you really found something that looked, looked promising, you could build the ultimate telescope, which would use the sun as a lens to bend the light. Um, except the problem is you could only put your focal point to look at a particular object. So you'd want to concentrate on something. Um, you could send probes to land on the surface of Europa and sample uh, what's on the surface and then also um, burrow through the ice into the ocean. Interstellar and have a missions? How about, how about interstellar missions? Well, that would probably take longer than my lifetime. Oh, you only want to do it for your lifetime? Well, I you think just want it, to discover it for your be, grandchildren? Well, I think. It, where would you know? To, how would you know where to send it? So first That's of all, first you of all, know? you'd have to put these telescopes up in space and and figure out where the habitable planets are. Then okay. maybe you could do that. Okay. What type? Now let's f put your rational behavior on so aside, and, and I'm going to ask you an emotional question. <laughs> I'm a scientist. Uh, I know that, but try to try to suppress the rational part of you, and I'll ask you an emotional question. What kind of life would you like to find? Um, I think the most definite. I feel. I feel. I think. Take away the thing. I feel. Okay. So if we could find life that is intelligent life that we can communicate with and that is more advanced than us, that is civilized and peaceful. <laughs> they, you want to find peaceful, civilized they life? Would, they would perhaps <laughs> be able to, you know, send us uh, information that could perhaps benefit society and make us make, take a quantum leap. So you want to in, find a benign God? Um... I think God is the wrong word. I don't want to find something well, that we so worship. Omniscient. Uh, not omniscient. No, no civilization is going to be omniscient. But well, they're going they, to have two they, billion years more advanced than you. Well, whatever it is, but they will certainly, hopefully, be, if they're benevolent, they would be able to help us. So, and the kind that you don't want to find? <laughs> <laughs> well, some people have speculated, and we don't know the answer, but people like Jared Diamond and a few other people have speculated that uh, there may be hostile mm -hmm. civilizations out there in the galaxy or in the universe. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the argument they use is they use one which is rather anthropocentric, so that causes me some skepticism, but they say, for example, look at the way Europeans spread around the world mm -hmm. and they killed off indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. um, when you have more technological humans than others, they always um, conquer them and uh, repress them. So they think, they argue, based on anthropological grounds, that uh, an advanced civilization would look at us in the same way that we look at, say, chimpanzees. Um, chimpanzees, that's only six million years difference. That's only six million two years. two billion years. That's yes. like more of amoebas, I think. Well, exactly. That's why they make this argument. But um, they may also be the kind of civilizations that, that have respect for other life forms uh, and have learned to respect other life forms on other planets. Um, in a way that, that, that basically says that they should not um, be hostile towards things like us. Now, Arthur C. Clarke once said that a sufficiently advanced tech, uh, civilization technology will be indistinguishable from magic. Mm -hmm. There's this German guy named Schroeder who said, no, no, a, suf uh, a sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. In other words, if you're really, really advanced, you don't, you know, cut down the rainforest and make your technology a big infrared throbbing computer. Rather, you learn to live with nature in a more sustainable way, and therefore you become harder to detect. So what do you think of that idea? Um, it may indeed be true in the sense that even we, when we look at our own rather short technological civilization, we're now using things that are low powered um, and we're hopefully many of us think that we should be more sustainable and not using up the earth's resources in an uh, unfettered way so well, we should be but we're not doing that so as far as i can tell the population well, is still least, going up and people are using more and more well with regards to communications at least people are using uh, techniques that don't require as much energy or are more efficient so for example we can use a one watt transmitter iphone which is not going to go very far we're going to be extremely difficult to detect this signal um, from, a, from another planet, or we, we're using cables, fiber optics, and so on, that, that gives no transmission to outer space. So it's more efficient to use low power signals and uh, ways of transmis transmission that, that don't leak out into space. So I think there may be some truth to that, but we really don't know. We should just keep looking. And there may be some civilizations that deliberately want to send out signals well, to well, make contact. So Stephen Hawking and others have suggested based on uh, maybe reasonable, but maybe not unreasonable paranoia or fear that we should uh, keep our head down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to one colleague recently who, who not only didn't want to send signals, but didn't think we should listen because these signals would have been so constructed to parasitize our minds and make us build a <laughs> machine which would then kill us or put, deliver us into their hands. What's your take on that? Uh, sounds like a paranoid delusion to me. <laughs> Okay, so you, you don't you think we, it's okay if we listen then? I think there can be no harm in listening. The information we get, we can decide what to do with it. Well, you saw the movie, uh, what was it, uh, Contact. Right, but I'm not, I don't um, take my information from Hollywood But in the movie Contact, science. the military guy was the one who kind of said, we shouldn't build this thing, this is probably going to, if we build it, it'll just destroy us or something. And he was that paranoid delusion, is that right? Right, yeah. Okay, and now at the end of the movie Contact, <laughs> Jodie Foster's character uh, says something like, the little kid says, you know, are we alone in the universe? And she says, well, if we are, it's a big waste of space. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Uh, that's partly why I think one should be optimistic, because we know that we live in a universe which has laws of physics and chemistry that are the same. That's why we're able to understand distant stars. And so the laws of physics and chemistry gave rise to Earth, gave rise to life on Earth, and they probably could do on other planets. So I, I don't, the idea that it's a waste of space assumes that there's, somebody cares about that space. I don't think uh, that's necessarily true, but I do think that um, assuming that we, we arose in a way which didn't require a miracle, then it should happen on other planets. Part of being a scientist is try to get rid of your subjective perspective as a human being and, and 
thinking that, uh, for example, that, you know, human-like adaptations are the best thing since sliced bread. And uh, I'm wondering, what do you have to make any effort in your speculations and your reasonings about early Earth and how universal it is and whether we should expect life elsewhere? Do you have any biases like, uh, for example, people thought there was a great chain of being there. The purpose of all this life is to evolve into humanity. And uh, that's what will happen here. It did, that's what happened here and that's what will happen elsewhere. Um, where do you see, if there's a, any type of pattern to the evolution of life on Earth, do you think that pattern is at all recognizable or will be recognizable in life elsewhere? Um, well, I think that's quite a difficult question to begin with because we only have our one sample, so we're extrapolating from a statistics of one, which is always a bad idea. Um, I think that the way that evolution works probably is applicable to other things that we would call living that have some kind of genome, that have some kind of metabolism that exists in some kind of environmental niche. I think all of that should be generally applicable because those are the general properties of life. They're not specific to one species, one genus, or one kingdom, well, even for example, or one heads. domain. Do you think aliens have heads, if there are aliens? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. Do you think they have <laughs> cell walls? For example, if RNA, if there was an RNA world, maybe it didn't necessarily have to start getting a cell and then turn into what we now call life. Maybe it's just an RNA world that could just continue as an RNA world. Uh, I think it has structure and differentiation. It must do in order to have a center of the organism that, that say, thinks, like we have a brain. Why do you have to have that? And it has an, a cent just... and a center that senses, maybe through uh, optical, maybe through infrared or whatever, but some kind of sensory um, Why can't you organs. just have an RNA world that stays an RNA world and doesn't produce cellular life? Oh, you could do, but that wouldn't be very interesting. I thought well, you were talking about higher organisms. Well, I'm talking about what, where life evolves once it starts to get going, whether it necessarily evolves into cellular life, for example. Or could it stay RNA world for billions and billions of years? Um, I don't think we know the answer to that. I think we just have to keep looking to try and figure this out. I, my suspicion is that um, there's, a, there's an evolutionary advantage when we look at terrestrial organisms to being encapsulated, to put your genome inside a little bag. Why do you say that? Because then somebody else can't use it or disrupt it. Well, same, so, but arguments like that have been made for big brains. It's, hey, if you have a big brain, you can do this and that and the other thing and then survive better. But that doesn't seem to be the case on Australia, for example, where they had kangaroos. Their brain cases don't seem to have been expanding for 50, 60, 70 million years. And so something that you would think would be a universal adaptation, i.e. big brains, doesn't seem to work out. So why would you think that putting well, a bag around something just because it's very generic and common now would be something that or any RNA world would aspire to? Because it would protect the genome and allow that organism to be more successful than the ones where the RNA is just floating around in, randomly in a solution and, and liable to be destroyed in, in myriads of ways. But it's kind of like saying nomads are better than sedentary farmers. Or no, nomads that's, are worse a, that's than a value sedentary judgment. Farmers. Well, that's kind of what you're saying. No, these RNAs, they don't even have a cell, therefore they're kind of like nomads. No, going, it's not a value judgment. Farm. It's not a value judgment. It's more of a based on the, the physics and the chemistry of the situation, that, that when they've got some kind of bang around them, that they are more likely to, in an evolutionary way, leave progeny. Well, but aren't you saying that my, our adaptation, we cellular life forms are better than you RNA world things? I'm not saying that. I'm saying you that- You said it's better, you said it would go is, that way. It's more sophisticated, and there's maybe, there, there appears to be an evolutionary advantage to do that. There appears I've, to be an evolution, can we test that idea? Um, probably, but it hasn't been tested yet. You'd have to make an RNA world that, uh, where some of the RNAs um, get a cell, a cell get, get encapsulated perhaps by lipids that can spontaneously in water form cell walls and see that if they are the ones that uh, basically survive and are best adapted to their niche, whereas the other ones don't survive. Conversely, so, you could say a bag with, uh, there are composomes, a bag with some chemicals in it that don't need DNA, and then there's DNA outside, and then these composomes are saying, hey, I don't need DNA, I could just divide it in half and control what comes in and out of my membrane by the chemistry inside of me. Okay, then such a bag doesn't have a genome, it doesn't really qualify as life, I don't think, because it, it doesn't have that information structure, instruction set 
well, presumably to, there was a time to in our reproduce history. and right. uh, leave progeny sure. that devolves. Sure, but there was a time in our history when we didn't have these things put sure. together in the way that you would then now had, qualify as then life. Then you had pre-life. Pre-life. Or prebiotic chemistry. Or proto-life. Proto-life, yeah. Okay. But there has, you have to go from, if, if we don't believe that, that you know, life is a miracle, we believe that it arose in some way which is scientifically explained, we had to go from a bunch of chemicals to something living, and there, were, there was a big gray area in between. That's partly why it's so difficult to define what life is, because at some point we went from non-life to life, and so life really is a threshold phenomenon. Where, a threshold phenomenon? Yeah, you have to, you can't define it without saying, okay, once you reach this threshold, then we have life. Is an eyeball a threshold phenomenon? Is an eyeball. Is there threshold? anything in biology that's a threshold besides life? Well, if you're talking about an eyeball, or then an you need eye. a ball. <laughs> but if, you, if you're talking well, about. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to call into question. If you're talking, the about, a the sensory eye, if you're talking about, about a sensory that, organ that's responsive to photons, then, um, you know, it would be something which causes the organism to move or whatever. Um, or to respond in some chemical way to is photons. Is there a threshold involved in this? Yes, it would have to be detectable chemically or chemically. by motion or something like also, that. So a, in the case it's of, an epistemological in, threshold, in the case a detectability of life, threshold rather than a ontological threshold, just uh, that's the way it is threshold. Well, if you're going to deal with definitions, then all definitions, I think, have some well, I don't, sort I'm of... I'm trying not to deal with definitions. That's why I'm asking sort these Sort of questions. thresholds, yeah. But, but often people want to know what is life. And I, and, and I try and, to dissuade um, them from insisting on <laughs> having a definition. And you're trying to in introduce one. So I'm well, pushing back. I'm saying that it's useful to have at least a, a general conception of what life is because that might help us design experiments to go from non-life to life and well, understand that transition, well, which is a big an, problem because well, we haven't an, solved it. Right, let me give you an example. Of, I call it the French passport problem. I've told mm -hmm. you about this, I think. And that is that if you're interested in the origin of French people, yeah. i.e. origin of life, origin of French people, you say, what is common about all French people today? Mm -hmm. Oh, they all have passports. So if you want to look at the origin of this threshold phenomenon called a Frenchman, you go looking in the archaeological record for passports. And the problem is that you've defined Frenchmen on the basis of current analysis of what a Frenchman is, not on the basis of something that has a more, has a better chance of being some, an enduring definition. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, when you say passports, you're forgetting the process and then concentrating on a rigid definition. Uh, uh, it gets the feeling that we're doing that with life. We're looking for information and a cell structure and a cell. And, a, uh, and uh, if we define it like that, then when we look at our ancestors who did not have passports, we say they weren't life. They weren't Frenchmen. Well, you're choosing a very narrow definition of... <laughs> well, that's what I'm of, saying. Aren't you choosing a, a very narrow definition of life when you say it has to have information, it has to have a cell wall, and it has to self-reproduce and any other list well, of... Well, I didn't say that, that it has to have a cell wall and all that. I, 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 a cell wall is different from a you generic see? bag of okay, something. Okay, okay, okay. Um, well, it just... Life as we know it is cellular, but the type of membrane or type of wall or whatever uh, is not that But let's go back four important. billion just... years, and then I'll ask the same question. I mean, we're a member of an RA world. You're one RNA one. I'm RNA two. And we're saying, where did we come from? How did we get to be this? And uh, we wouldn't be asking about uh, cell walls and things like that. We'd be saying, how did this organizational information inside of me and inside of you get here? Well, actually, we wouldn't be asking anything because <laughs> RNAs don't think or talk. They're just chemicals. And so... Um, oh, we're not just chemicals? Uh, well, we're bags of chemicals that can talk and reason and do what we're doing now. So that's very far, very far removed from the RNA world. I think. But, but having a big brain doesn't shouldn't have much to do with the usefulness of trying to understand what life is earlier on, before there were brains and eukaryotes and multicellular things. That's certainly a part of our reality that we can dispense with and say, look, earlier there weren't people, so let's talk about life before there were people, life before there were conversations. And so that's the, that's the relevance of having one RNA and another RNA. They would be asking the question if they had brains, but they don't obviously, mm -hmm. where did we come from? And that's a legitimate scientific question that we can ask now. Mm -hmm. It's just we've gone back so far that we've 
undone many of the things in what we would normally call life. And then we're asking what happened earlier. And mm -hmm. so it's, it seems to me that I'm trying to undo what you call the threshold. Well, I think pe people in general would say that RNA world, you know, that's not life at that point. It's, on the, it's a stepping stone on the way to life as we currently understand it. On the way. On the way. Not, yeah. a, not a, something on its own that was, is legitimately valid that could just stay that way in, on other planets. If we find a well, planet maybe full could, of RNA, we well, don't, we don't we know. Say, it doesn't have life or it does or what? I mean, basically all of these questions about exactly how does biology work would benefit from finding life elsewhere. So they, to my mind, they just... But wait, if we found um, an RNA world, you wouldn't be finding life and it wouldn't benefit because you would say, it's not life, let's not talk about well, it. Well, you'd find proto-life. So that would help, That would help, for example, that would greatly verify the th what currently is a theory yeah. that life was preceded by an RNA world, that such a thing actually existed if we found it somewhere else. For example, if we found it on, in the ocean of Europa or in the ocean of Enceladus, um, then I think... Uh, you know that would actually make turn that theory into something much, much a much stronger theory. How about memes? Memes have been suggested as uh, like a life form, like genes. Uh, do you mm -hmm. think memes are alive, in the sense that uh, genes are alive? Um, you know, the selfish genes, selfish memes, kind of thing. I think that's just a different domain. There, you're talking about information between humans, and you're trying to classify it. I mean, it's not the same as a gene which is a physical entity. I mean, it's a physical entity, but also ex ex expresses something in the, in the phenotype of an organism. So you don't and think so information so can be substrate independent? Um, well, that's more of a philosophical question, I think, than a scientific question. No, it's a scientific question in the sense that, you know, if life is a, a, the evolution of information, then independent of whether it's on DNA or RNA or XNA, mm -hmm. or if, as long as it's a code with information, then we might be very tempted. Many of us would definitely say that's life. And that would mean it would be substrate independent. For example, if we found silicon-based life, so you know, life is organic for four billion years, and then it, everybody mm -hmm. turns into silicon, and then it turns into, I don't know, some crazy intergalactic uh, Google or something, and that wouldn't be organic anymore. And so Martin Rees, for example, the astronomer Royale, thinks we should not be looking for organic life and chemical disequilibrium, but we should be looking for computers and simul I don't know, silico-based life, or, in, other, in other words, substrate-independent information of any kind. Well, I think he's using an argument which is not fair enough in the sense that if we project our own future, then we could imagine building robots and there could be a certain point where this artificial intelligence is greater than our own and maybe they can reproduce. But their origin ultimately is an organic origin, right? Because it was, our, it was us that gave rise to them. And so the origin is an RNA world. The well, origin is an abiotic world. Yes, an abiotic world that then goes through proto prebiotic chemistry, some kind of proto life, and then life. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there still should be that kind of life out there. I mean, remember that existed on the Earth for yeah, they would look back four and a half us. billion years. No, but they'd look back at us and say, "That's not life. That's crazy stuff. That's that's proto proto life." Well, they're supposed to be more intelligent than us by <laughs> well, this that's, definition, that's, and, and so they should you, they should know where they came from if they're more intelligent. That's, than well, that's us. what I'm saying. But and that means world. that, we and that know means where they we came, came from, from organic life. I've never oh, seen organic proto life. You mean because life would be they would define life as silicon based, you know, wires and computer signals and well, they're kind of life, but if they're so intelligent, they would know that they came from organic life. Yes, but they would not call that organic life life. They would call it proto-life, because life would be what they were. Well, that's... Um, this is cultural relativism. Specul that's highly speculative. <laughs> <laughs> it is highly speculative. I can't that. <laughs> but it's... Uh, I know. So do you have any uh, more but, accurate speculations about the future? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the idea that there are... Uh, that really advanced life might include things like, like silicon-based life or, or whatever turns into robotic life and artificial intelligence, whatever that is, I think is reasonable if such civilizations exist elsewhere in the universe. 
but we don't know it that yet. So we just have to, at this point, I think it's best to look for the kind of life that we know. Do you how, do you look, how do you look for this silicon-based life? What's, what, you, what are you looking for you with your don't telescopes? don't look on planets, because they're not necessarily associated with planets and water. They've, they've thrown off the shackles of a planetary atmosphere and water, and they just zoom around the universe, uh, I don't know, taking observations <laughs> and saying philosophical things to each other. Do they? I, I, I have no <laughs> idea, but one thing is... How do you look for that? Well, presumably you look for the signal, like SETI people. You use SETI searches okay. rather than chemical disequilibrium. Right, fine. I, I don't dispute that you should continue to look for SETI signals. That's, that would be part of my strategy in this hypothetical scenario where money's no limit. Okay, so let's talk, remember, this is for a MOOC, and we're talking about student, students. So what do you think the biggest mistake that students make when they start thinking about this question, are we alone? Um, I think that... Students can sometimes be heavily influenced by the media, what they see on TV, what they see in the movies. And in reality, uh, the Earth, for most of its history, but consisted you know of just... That's, that was loud. Let's take it again. Okay. okay. So uh, students often think about this uh, question, and they're heavily influenced by Hollywood. And what are the biggest mistakes that they make when they're thinking about this question, are we alone? Well, because they're heavily influenced by things like movies and what they read in the me media and science fiction, then they tend to think that um, perhaps the universe is inhabited by the kind of organisms that they see in Star Wars or some other movie where the organisms are somewhat similar to us, except they may have trunks coming out of their head, but otherwise they have a couple of eyes and maybe arms, but, but maybe they have six of them or f legs, but maybe four of them or something like that. And so they're not really that different to us. And, in, and the reality is that for most of the history of the Earth, life was pretty simple. And so you should expect to see on other planets life very often um, in a simple form. Uh, if maybe that will affect the environment. Um, and then what exactly intelligent life would look like or advanced life uh, could be extremely different to what we have here on Earth. Can you say anything about the probability of once you have life, you then get human-like intelligent life? Can you assess that probability at all? Well, based on observational evidence, we know nothing about that um, since we only have the one example from the Earth. What we can say is that when we look at the Earth, there were organisms that were very successful, such as the dinosaurs, which reigned on Earth for 170 million years. And as far as we know, none of those were technologically intelligent. We have found no dinosaur hammers or wrenches. We found no dinosaur microwave ovens. They were here for 170 million years and yet that just didn't happen because they were successful with their big claws and teeth or just munching on leaves. Okay, let's ask the question again. Um, tell me what you know about the answer to the question, are we alone? Do you have any estimates about that and why do you have those estimates? Okay, observationally we have no detection of life elsewhere. So observationally, we're alone with current observations and technology. However, we know that life arose out of a process of physics and chemistry, and physics and chemistry is common throughout the universe, which is why we're able to understand distant stars and galaxies. Um, and the kind of conditions that gave rise to life includes liquid water and includes redox chemistry, and such things should exist on planets elsewhere. We're already discovering planets that sit in the habitable zone of their stars. That means they should have liquid water on the surface if, it, if, they endowed, if they're endowed with water. Um, but but so physics I'm, and chemistry and water also gave rise to English. Yes. But that doesn't mean it's a reason why we should go looking for English speakers out in the universe. No, but we have evidence that English didn't only arose very specifically at a specific time with specific Couldn't types of organisms. Couldn't I say the same thing about life? No, because I'm talking about general properties of life, the need for liquid water and the need for redox chemistry that well, are English applicable to, they're applicable to blue whales, bacteria, and you, yeah. and um, even the reproduction of viruses, which is a par parasitic organism. So um, that is general, whereas what you're talking about, looking for organisms that happen to speak English, is incredibly specific. We should look for what's general, not so incredibly specific. Now, it could be that there is no life elsewhere, in which case looking for life is looking for something too specific, but we don't know that. We have to um, basically assume 
a Copernican principle that perhaps we're kind of average and so life exists elsewhere and we won't know until we look and that's why I think it's worth looking to okay. address this with data, not philosophy. Is there anything else you want to say to these MOOC students? Um, good luck. Have fun with astrobiology. <laughs> <laughs>